Welcome everyone. The session is being recorded and good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for today's special webinar, Lessons from a Former Army Nurse, The Impact of PTSD on Healthcare Workers from Vietnam to COVID, which features two special alumni guests, um, Joan Fury, Myers 76, and Professor Beth Norman, Steinhardt 76 and 86. Welcome to you both. This webinar is being hosted by the NYUS Alumni Association, and my name is Eileen Peters. I will be co-hosting today's webinar with my wonderful colleague, Catherine Hall, who's the Assistant Director for our, our Alumni Affinity Programs. Welcome, Catherine. On behalf of NYU, we want to thank you for joining us today for this special program. Please know that all of us at NYU hope that you and your loved ones are safe and well. Now, before we move on, I'd like to remind our guests that if you have any questions for experts, you can drop them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can at the conclusion of the program. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome Beth. Beth, take it away. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. I'm Beth Norman. I'm a professor in Steinhardt, where I teach in the interdisciplinary research study sequence. I'm also an NYU alum. I have my master's and doctorate degree from the school when it was known as CNAP, uh, and I'm a registered nurse. I'm so pleased to introduce the person I'll be interviewing today. Joan Fury graduated from NYU with a master's degree in nursing, and uh, she also was a lieutenant in the Army Nurse Corps and served in Vietnam from January 69 until January 1970 as a critical care nurse stationed at the 71st Evacuation Hospital in Pleiku, South Vietnam, which was in the Central Highlands, uh, not too far from Cambodia in the mountains. She received a Bronze Star for her service. After the war, Joan worked as a nurse at the VA Medical Center in Bay Pines, Florida, then as an Associate Director of Education for the National Center for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, and later, for eight years at the VA Central Office in Washington, DC, where she was the founding director of the VA Center for Women Vets. Joan was interviewed for episode eight of Ken Burns' acclaimed documentary, The Vietnam War. She is also a co-editor of the book, Visions of War, Dreams of Peace, an anthology of poetry and prose written by women who served in Vietnam, it was published by Warner Books in 1982. She now lives on Long Island. Now, this is not the first time Joan and I have met. I interviewed her in 1984 as part of my NYU dissertation, Nurses at War, a study of 50 female military nurses who served in Vietnam. We kept in periodic touch um, and uh, over the years and last saw each other uh, and spoke at the Vietnam Women's Memorial when it was dedicated in 1994. That is, until this summer, when we reconnected to give a talk. Who would have thought 26 late years later, Joan, you and I would be together? I, um, before, before we start uh, your talk on your experiences in Vietnam, let's talk about your concerns for healthcare workers um, in a stressful situation who might be overlooked, whether at war or during the pandemic. What worries do you have? Thank you, Beth. Uh, before I answer your question, I, I just want to take a minute to thank Eileen and Catherine for inviting me to be a part of the NYU Alumni's webinar series. And of course, to thank you for <laughs> not just moderating this, but for the help you gave me in uh, putting this together. Uh, <laughs> I, my concerns really are based on uh, the experience from my own journey of recovery, which uh, started 45 years ago, although I probably didn't know that, that it had started at that time. Uh, when I came back from Vietnam, I, uh, like so many people, had uh, some response to my experience. I was trying to make meaning of it and to understand my confusion and conflict and feelings that I had. And when I went and looked in the literature, both the professional literature and the popular literature, I realized that there really was uh, 
very little written about women who had been to war. Um, there was a considerable body of evidence, a body of literature for men, both in the popular literature um, and in the professional literature, but uh, nothing have uh, nothing about women. And uh, since I was home and alone, and there were only over the 10 years that we served in Vietnam, 8,000 women who served over there, I didn't meet another woman. There was no other woman around. And uh, so there was no real resource or anyone that I could share my experiences with. Well, things have certainly improved greatly over the years. Uh, I still think that uh, the impact of extreme work stress on and emotional well-being on healthcare workers, both in the military and uh, more recently with the COVID-19, is still not fully appreciated. Um, I think it's amazing that we haven't heard very much from the healthcare, the military healthcare workers who have served in our more recent wars, like in Iraq and Afghanistan. Because I have personally talked to and been asked to talk to a number of them who really believed they were suffering from PTSD, but they were afraid to talk about it. They were afraid to seek help because of how they might be perceived by their colleagues or the people that they worked with. And I think this fear was dramatically expressed uh, in the recent New York Times article about Dr. Lorna Breen, the ER physician, I believe, from the Mount Sinai Hospital, uh, who following her battle with COVID-19 uh, as both an emergency room physician and someone who contracted it because of her work, uh, committed suicide. Because one of the things I think her sister said in the article, she was so concerned about how she'd be perceived by her peers and by the people that she worked with, that somehow or other she, this highly competent woman, uh, would be perceived as being less than able to continue in her work. And I really felt that that underscored the fact that healthcare workers to this day remain concerned about how they will be perceived if they acknowledge any concerns, any weaknesses, any distress, that somehow or other their, those concerns would be met with questions about their professional competence or fitness for duty. Real or imagined, I think those concerns exist. And while I think the leadership of the professions have really begun to address these issues, I think there's still a lot of work to be done uh, in that area. You know, Joan, there clearly are lessons to be learned from nurses like yourself who've served in American wars. We might talk about and reflect on the nurses from World War II in Korea, but let's start with you. Let's start with you serving as a second lieutenant in 1969, 1970. I've put together slides that you and I have gathered and I'm gonna to start to show them and we can talk behind them and stop them periodically. But the first question, and it's just the obvious question, why did you join the military and why did you volunteer to go to Vietnam? Well, Beth, as you and I have discussed, there's so many factors that go into making that kind of a decision. And as I've really thought about this over the years and, you know, tried to go back to that time, I realized that there were so many experiences from my childhood that I really do believe influenced that decision. Um, like so many of our generation, uh, my father was a combat veteran of World War II. And uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, which I like to tell people who don't always appreciate it, that the neighborhood that I grew up in was like a small town, really. Um, and everybody's father, everybody's uncle, it's like, like almost all the men had served in World War II. And it was really integrated into our uh, formative years about the courage and the bravery of these men, that they saved the world for democracy. Um, we spent my childhood watching movies, my, my older sister and I watching movies on Saturday afternoon, most of them with the World War II theme starring John Wayne and um, you know some of the other big male stars. But you never heard about women. I never knew women 
I never mentioned women. And then one Saturday morning, my sister and I were um, watching the movie, and this movie came on called So Proudly We Hail. There we go. And uh, Beth is putting up uh, this slide, and this slide is a cover of a DVD that my older sister sent to me for Christmas about 10 years ago because uh, the movie, which I couldn't believe that the movie came out on DVD. And um, what was so striking about this movie was it talked about the nurses who had served in the Philippines on Bataan and Corregidor during the fall of Japan and were taken prisoners of war. I know something you know, have written about. A little bit about. And um, I mean, I, I remember even as a kid, I, I had to be 10 years old, just being stunned that there were these women who had been brave and courageous and had served because I had never heard any of that before. If women who were in any of these movies, they were always kind of the romantic interest. interest. They were never doing anything that would be considered um, contributing to the, what was going on. Um, and I, I actually really believe that 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 movie made me decide to become a nurse because I've always said I always wanted to be a nurse from the time I was 10. So click, click, right? Um, so I, I, I went into, graduated from high school in 1964 and I went into nursing school. And uh, so I was in nursing school, three year hospital school in nursing from 1964 to 1967, which was during the really build up of the Vietnam War. Um, and as student nurses, uh, we received copies of the American Journal of Nursing every month uh, so that we could keep abreast of what was going on. And one of the things uh, that was in the journal, and these are two, um, uh, two, two ads that were in the journals that uh, had an impact. I mean, one was how to bandage a war and the other was do needed. And these really struck me. I graduated in the fall of 1967. And during that time, the anti-war movement was really beginning to escalate. There were a lot of uh, demonstrations going on, including those, for those of us from our age group who remember the huge demonstrations at Columbia University, including the sit-in uh, for the uh, sit-in of the students. And this all occurred at the same time of the Tet Offensive, which for those of you who were the 1968 Tet Offensive. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, the 1968 Tet Offensive was a dramatic blow to the American uh, 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 presence in, in Vietnam. Uh, it was an offense by the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong against American facilities across the country. There were many American casualties and deaths. Um, in fact, some were from my hometown. And um, at that time, it's hard to, I think, express how Vietnam was all over the TV. And at that time, we didn't have 24-hour cable news. We had three stations, you know, they showed the news. And every night, it was the anti-war demonstrations and scenes of the battle and the deaths and the casualties of uh, from Vietnam. And I, I remember being so angry about the Columbia demonstrations and, that, and then being angry at myself because I was a nurse. I felt I could contribute to, to this. I should be contributing to it. And uh, I really chastised myself for not joining sooner. And so really what I did is I left work one day, dove straight to the Army recruiter station in Patchogue, which by the way is still there, <laughs> about 10 miles from where I live right now. And uh, I walked in and I said, I'm a nurse and I want to go to Vietnam. And they said, sign here. <laughs> so uh, that's, really, uh, that's really how it all happened. So I'm just going to cut the slides for a minute. So you literally signed up and off you went. 
<laughs> off I went. My parents didn't know. I went home and they walked in and I said, so I just joined the army and volunteered to go to Vietnam. I mean, you, you want to not hear a pin drop. You should have been in that house that day. Well, that must have been quite a conversation. Um, we're going to move forward and, and, and talk about Vietnam. And, and I really would like you to tell us about your experiences and your responsibilities as a critical care nurse during that time. Now, I've got slides to show, and some of the slides are official Army photographs, and some of them are private, belong to you. But let's start, and let's, <clears throat> let's go to Vietnam, and li not literally, and I believe <laughs> that this first slide that we're going to see is you. That's, That's me. The first of X. So um, start to talk about what it was like to be over there as a nurse. Okay. Well, number one, as you can see from this slide, I was uh, quite young. I was actually 22 uh, in this uh, particular photo, which is how old I was when I when I went to Vietnam. Uh, and actually, the truth of the matter is, over 64 percent of the uh, nurses who served in Vietnam were under the age of 25. So we were really all very, very young. Uh, many of these uh, photos. This is me taking care of. Uh, one of five burn patients I was assigned to that day that had uh, burns over, second and third degree burns over 50% of their bodies. Um, and as I was the nurse in charge and I had one corpsman helping me to take care of these five patients. Uh, some of the other slides that you'll see were taken during one of the MISH casualty events. Um, and unfortunately, during my time in Vietnam, 1969, uh, I was in 71st was one of the busiest hospitals in Vietnam. Um, so uh, mass casualties were not uncommon. And yeah, let me change the slide here, John. Yeah. Okay. We refer to these as all hands on deck events um, because uh, they usually occurred when there was either a particularly long or widespread battle that lasted for 24 to 48 hours and massive numbers of casualties would be brought in. Helicopters would just come in, offload, land. Actually, I was watching TV last night and they showed a Chinook helicopter that had evacuated a number uh, of uh, these people who were caught in the fires in California and I was taken aback because we had during these times Chinook helicopters, which could really take on up to 50 patients, land on the helipad and offload 50 casualties. And uh, as a large receiving facility, we would uh, sometimes have over 50 patients arrive at one time, most of whom, or many of whom sustained multiple traumatic uh, injuries, severe burns, gunshot wounds, fragmentation wounds, uh, uh, traumatic amputations because they stepped on mines, severe head and neck or spinal cord injuries. Um, plus, something that people often don't know is women and children and other civilians, usually old men, who happened to be in the area of the battle and were, as they say, collateral damage. Um, the, the only word to describe these injuries were horrific. Um, they often required multiple surgeries. Uh, we had to go through a triage process where, you know, basically doctors were, um, went in and in assessing the extent of the injuries that somebody sustained would decide whether or not uh, they could survive them even with medical intervention. And sometimes they couldn't. They didn't believe they could. And these patients were listed as expectants. Um, I did talk about this in the Ken Burns film, how difficult it was because these patients were then brought to the intensive care unit because their wounds were so severe. Uh, they were listed as expectant. And basically our job was to just make them as comfortable as possible uh, until they died. And um, it, it was a, just such a very, very hard thing to do because at the same time that we had those patients, 
we would be caring for these other patients who often will wind up in the hall waiting to go in for surgery. They'd come in. My unit was a combined of what we would call today recovery room post-op ICU. And, and this is an example of the patients lined up uh, in one section of the ER. Um, and just to give you uh, an idea of the workload, uh, our post-op ICU was a 30-bed unit. It was kind of had a dividing uh, half wall down the middle of it. We had 15 patients on each side. And our usual staffing for our 12-hour shift was three or four nurses and two corpsmen. So that really meant that one nurse and one corpsman would be assigned to either side of the unit. So that would be about 15 patients. And one nurse would do medications. Uh, if we were fortunate enough to have a fourth nurse, she would help out wherever it was needed. Um, and uh, we basically never stopped. I mean, it was, uh, it, it was just one patient after another. And these were not minor injuries. This was a recovery room ICU. So we had multiple patients with multiple traumatic injuries who demanded an incredible high level of care. And uh, we were the staff and we worked 12 hours a day, six days a week. Sometimes we would have to work longer than that because um, we, were, we were it. And um, certainly there were days when if we weren't that busy, we might get off duty a little bit earlier. But for the most part, we did work very long hours and we had uh, one day off a week, but would be on call if there was a mass casualty event. You know, before I go to the next slide, I'm always struck when you and I went over these slides of you working in Vietnam, just to look at the faces of the nurses and the corpsmen and the patients. They, they just, they tell stories that nothing else will do, but we'll move on to another aspect, which most people don't realize. Yeah, most people, a lot of people, it's amazing how when you talk to people, they think, you were in some kind of little safe area, some hospital where nothing ever happened. This is a picture of an aerial photo of my hospital in the uh, foreground. Um, and you can see that surgical T there. That's where the patients would come in to one side was the OR to the other side was the post-op ICU. And behind them are the hospital wards and the quarters were on either side of that. But you'll notice in the rear, uh, all of these large towers. And this was the communication centers for the Central Highland. So they boarded, uh, we, we shared a perimeter with them. If you could see the other side, you would see the perimeter of the Playco Air, Air Base. So, uh, and I always like to point out people think there were big red crosses on the top of our hospitals. There is not a red cross to be seen. Uh, whether that was good or bad, I don't know. But certainly we were uh, often came under rocket and mortar attacks. Uh, it was very common in our area, our hospital, uh, people would want to try to take out the communications tower or hit the air base. Yeah. Um, something would fall short or go long. They were on either side of us. So it was uh, not uncommon for us to uh, come under mortar and rocket fire on a pretty, pretty regular basis. And um, there was no, no way when you were on duty, uh, if you were in your hooch or, you know, where you lived, you'd get out and get under your bed. But if you were on duty, the patients really could not get out of bed. They were critically ill patients. And if you see the slide on the other side, yeah. Uh, what you're looking at there may be hard to distinguish that when you don't know what you're looking at. Those are patients that we were there. I actually took this picture during a rocket attack. Uh, we pulled up the side rails and we had to grab the uh, mattresses either off unoccupied beds or if all the beds were occupied, we had stretcher mattresses out in the hall and we would run out now, during these times, I have to say, the people from the ER, the people from the OR, everybody would run in because we knew we had to cover these patients immediately. 
And our job was we had to go into blackout. We had to turn out the lights. We put on our flak vests and helmets. And these patients still required care. So we would crawl around on the floors from bed to bed, um, uh, talking with the patients, keeping them calm, letting them know we were there. And I always tell people, you have no idea what it's like to try to keep um, about 30 uh, mostly naked combat soldiers who are helpless in bed calm during a rocket attack when they can't do anything or go anywhere. And that was basically what the situation was. Um, so uh, our own personal safety, I don't even think we thought about our own personal safety. There was uh, one nurse, Sharon Lane, whose name is on the wall, who was killed during a rocket attack at her hospital. Um, so, you know, there was that issue of, uh, coming under rocket and mortar attack. And then as they've always said about Vietnam, there really was no safe place. Yeah. Now, Joan, this may seem like an obvious question, but what is it about that experience that put you at risk for PTSD? And maybe while you're talking about it, speculate on what's similar uh, with recent active duty military veterans and COVID nurses working with COVID-19 that puts them at risk for PTSD. Uh, well, obviously, there were uh, a lot of factors that contributed to our risk. I think I talked about some of them. Number one was the exposure to incredibly high rates of death and dying or disfigured, disabled uh, patients with massive traumatic injuries. In our case, it was with people who were very young. These were young men. I was 22, and I would say the vast majority of our patients were younger than I was. Uh, 17, 18, 19 years old. We had this incredible workload. We were isolated from our normal support systems. Uh, and back then, you know, we, we, we got to call home twice a year, uh, if we were lucky. Um, there was no internet, there was no way to uh, be in communication other than, than writing letters. Um, the workload, of course, was uh, incredible. And plus we had the continuing fear of personal injury, of contracting infectious diseases. Uh, we had a, a physician from our hospital die from hepatitis. Um, there was malaria. There were all kinds of exotic diseases that patients were brought in that, uh, particularly civilians from the civilian population that we had never even seen in the United States. I think the other thing was that and I like to say we had more than a few existential dilemmas. And I think these are probably universal, whether you're in war, whether COVID. You try to understand what it is you're experiencing and what you're seeing and why it's happening. So you, you, there is a really a search for meaning among the chaos. Uh, certainly there is, a, a, for many people, a loss of faith because they, they just can't find the meaning in the tremendous loss and trauma that is going on. I think you also experience feelings of inadequacy, like no matter what you do, it's never enough. It's not enough. I have to do more. I have to do more. And so that leads you to feel guilty because, uh, because you couldn't do more. Uh, you're kind of in a state of chronic anxiety and chronic stress. So I, I think those things, those themes go throughout uh, all people who serve in, in war zones, who serve in some of these more chaotic situations. And certainly, I think, uh, among the people who were dealing with this uh, incredible numbers of COVID-19 patients who were coming into the hospitals and dying and demanding care, and there, there just wasn't, uh, as they say, there was not, never enough time and never enough hands to do what needed to be done. You know, Joan, even an experience like war and combat or dealing with the overwhelming COVID-19 suffering and death, most experiences um, have a beneficial side to them too, which sounds contradictory. But were there rewards for being a nurse in Vietnam? Do you think veterans and nurses working with COVID-19 patients um, had similar rewards? I'm gonna flip the slide here. 
Um, actually, you know, uh, it's funny. The way that I can answer that is, you know, yes, absolutely there are. It takes a while sometimes to find them or to come to recognize them. And I think that that certainly is what happened to me. But um, I think one of the one of the things, and I, and I have said this so many times, that in my entire career, I've had a very long and rewarding career in nursing, that nothing ever matched the commitment uh, and the camaraderie that we had with each other in Vietnam. We were so committed to the work that we were doing, to taking care of these young soldiers, to wanting them to, to live and survive and, and get home. There, there was, uh, I mean, actually, we used to say there was no BS in Vietnam, meaning the political nonsense that a lot of times you have to deal with in uh, stateside or civilian settings. We were there for each other, doctors, nurses, corpsmen. And this is an example of that. What you're seeing here is a group of doctors, nurses, and corpsmen. And I think we have one lieutenant colonel right there sitting next to Peaches, whom I know you know, <laughs> who, who was a combat infantryman. and. Uh, this yeah. was at a, uh, I think those are Christmas cookies. It was at a, at, a, at a Christmas gathering. And we were just committed to each other. And regardless of our feelings for the war, against the war, whatever, we knew how important our work was, how meaningful it was, and it trumped everything else. I think the other thing was that we were surrounded by young men whose uh, courage, uh, both on the battlefield or in dealing with their injuries was beyond inspiring. Um, some of the acts we heard about or witnessed, I mean, I could tell so many stories it would take forever, uh, of just unimaginable courage and self-sacrifice. And it was just an honor to be there and to care for them and and to bear witness to what they did and, and uh, what they survived. I think another thing that you maybe don't realize until really later on is the, the resources that you find within yourself. I mean, as I mentioned, and I do like to go back to this because, you know, I, I sit here now, I'm in my 70s. I, I was 22. I turned 23 just before I came home. Um, and I, as did most of us, and we had to we had to find resources within ourselves to that we really didn't know we had. And I'm not sure that I have ever been in another situation in my life that would have caused me to find the personal resources within myself that I had to find to survive in Vietnam, to do what I did in Vietnam to uh, take on the challenges that were presented to me. And uh, I think I learned later in life that those, once you find those resources, you carry them with you. And um, they really can get you through almost any, uh, any situation. We had a saying in Vietnam when anything went bad, <laughs> you know, if, uh, uh, you know, we sometimes resisted the authoritarian, our, our superiors. Uh, we'd look at each other and say, so what are they gonna do, send me to Vietnam? It was like, you know, that's the worst possible thing you could do. You could send me to Vietnam, duh, I'm already here. Uh, I've conquered this so I can conquer anything else. Um, Joan, you're not gonna believe this, but we're running short on time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm just gonna move on to the next slide. Um, because it, I think it's one of the most remarkable ones I've ever seen. And I'm just gonna let you continue to talk because what you can do here is talk about your experience with PTSD. Okay, I, and I'll just tie into, these are two pictures of me. The first one, or the one where I'm smiling might be the best one, was taken, uh, I had only been in Vietnam about six weeks. I had someone take this picture, I could send it home to my mom and dad and family and they could see it. The other picture, uh, and I always refer to this as my thousand yard stare picture because people talk about combat veterans and they never include nurses in that. This was uh, the week before I left Vietnam after a year in the intensive care unit. 
I'd just been awarded the Bronze Star. Literally, this picture was taken when the commanding officer had, they had called me up from the unit to, to give me the Bronze Star for my work. So this is a very high honor and one would be normally overjoyed by that. This is a picture of me being overjoyed. So you can see the, <laughs> the flattened affect. Um, and uh, I think that really kind of sums up uh, some of my own experiences with PTSD. I think you have to remember this was back in January of 1970. There wasn't even a diagnosis about PTSD. Um, people didn't know it existed. Uh, basically, the message was you served, you go home, you get back to your life, you know, what's the problem? And then you get home and you find out that you can't go back to your life. You find out that um, you're kind of haunted by some of the things that you've seen. Um, wakes you up in the middle of the night. It will flip into your thinking at, at any point in time. Um, you, you look at everything and you compare it to what you experienced in Vietnam. So if you're taking care of a patient, you say, well, this patient, you know, they had their gallbladder out. They should be fine. They should be out of here because you know, I just took care of people whose half their body was blown away. And, uh, and yet on another level, you said, oh my God, I've lost my ability to relate. And it became very threatening professionally. Um, you, uh, you, don't, uh, you feel somewhat alienated from your friends even, and from your family because you, you really believe people don't get it. They don't understand. They'll never understand. And how can I go back to this life when, you know, for us at the time, this is still going on. I should be back there. That's where I belonged. Um, and sometimes I think you think you're going crazy. And, uh, uh, and, and, and then you put so much energy into hiding what you're feeling because you're afraid that if people know that, uh, they're going to think there's something, quote, wrong with you. And uh, uh, you're going to lose uh, everything that you've worked so hard for, for all these years. Uh, and the one last thing I do want to mention is the thing about pride, because uh, those of us who served in Vietnam were very proud of what we did, but that pride was taken away from us by what was going on in the culture around us. So we couldn't express our pride. And if we expressed our pride in what we did, we were usually called names, warmongers and whatever. So um, that, was something that I think the current people don't have to deal with. And I think that that is a real gift. They can be proud of what they did. And society recognizes that and, yeah. and honors that. It yeah. took us a long time to get that. And I do think that interfered with our ability to heal as quickly as they might be able to. Um, and you saw a therapist, right? You said- I, I did, yes, I did. I, uh, I finally did seek help from a private therapist. Um, and I went in when I saw her, I said to her, I don't want to tell me anything about PTSD. I just want to, you know, do this. So anyhow, we started talking. I started sharing some of my experiences. And at one point she stopped me and she said, Joan, I just want to say one thing to you. I, I want to know, ask you one thing. I want to know why you think you have could gone through all that and then just be okay. And, um, I think, as I said, that was one of the nicest things yeah. anyone could have said to me. You know, given your ex personal experience and professional experience with PTSD, um, I'm gonna put some slides up that could be like a primer. Would you walk us through these slides? Yeah, um, these are just, a, uh, you know, uh, something to let people know what PTSD is about, which it isn't a me mental health or emotional problem that uh, is very normal that people develop when they are exposed to traumatic events or life-threatening events. Um, and you can read for yourself. Uh, it's commonly when you feel like you don't have control over what's happening. Yeah, let's think this, uh, These are some of the common symptoms. I think people can read them, uh, but I, I do want to point out about the intrusive thoughts and unwelcome memories and finding yourself doing things to avoid uh, 
uh, anything that might trigger your memories, this feeling of isolated and not being understood. And uh, a very common one, which is the sleep disorders, the anxiety, self-medication, people who have that typically may find themselves using alcohol or other drugs to bring themselves down, to put themselves to sleep, and they can really be at risk to develop uh, problems with substance abuse. Sure. And uh, I think it's important to consider treatment. Some of these things, some people have them, they, they resolve themselves pretty quickly. Other people, you know, you can get into all kinds of reason why that is. The, uh, the symptoms persist. They sit over time. For some people, they go away and then they come back during other times of stress during their life. But if you have persistent symptoms, if you feel like they're disrupting your daily life, your personal relationships, your social life, or they're comp compromising you in any way professionally, you, you really need to consider going to talk to someone. It doesn't mean your professional life is over. It, does, it doesn't mean that you're crazy and you're never going to be okay. The one thing those of us who survived all this and went through all this from Vietnam learned that you can be okay. You can recover. Yeah. Well, you know, here's our final slide. Um, and let's bring it right up to today, to the COVID pandemic, what we're all experiencing. But, but you know, here's a slide of uh, COVID nurses during the COVID pandemic, registered nurses. Um, what do you think these people in this slide and other healthcare workers on the front lines during the pandemic, and, and let's bring in recent military veterans, what can they learn from your experience? You've talked about it a little already, but I think let's wrap it up with what do you want to share with the people today? Yeah, I think the best response I can give to that question is to share with everyone some thoughts from an open letter that was written by a group of nurses, medics, and other uh, veterans who served in Vietnam who are now members of Vietnam Veterans of America. And they sent this out as, as a press release to those people serving on the front lines in the battle against COVID-19. And I'm gonna quote from it because I, I think it just really sums it up. This may well be one of the most intense experiences of your life. Your coworkers will be with you forever as you are sharing something that no one else who truly understand. Take care of each other. We spent too many years after we came home from the war denying our feelings and memories. One of the legacies of the Vietnam War is that society now accepts post-traumatic stress as a natural reaction to abnormal events. We discovered the importance of seeking professional help to explore the emotional residue created by our war. We had to take a deep dive into our feelings and search our souls in order to heal ourselves. We know this path. It is a lifelong journey. You have to remember that your loved ones are also suffering and sacrificing with you. And don't forget to include them in this process. Family and friends are your first line of support as are your coworkers. And I can say that to this day, I have friends, some of whom I didn't serve was in Vietnam, but were there, who uh, have just been instrumental in, uh, in my work and in my life and in helping me to continue to do what I do uh, every day. You know, to say thank you, Joan, it doesn't even begin to cover it. <laughs> Um, and one of the good things is it's just been wonderful to connect with you after 26 years. Thanks for sharing your story again with me and other people. And now we'll turn the presentation over to Eileen Peters and um, Catherine Hall. Joan, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. It's incredible to hear what you have to say firsthand about your experience. Um, and Beth, thank you so much for guiding this conversation. Um, we have a few questions in the chat, and if anyone has any additional, drop them into the Q&A and I can, I can see those. Um, just, a, just a basic question. I think we've all heard the term shell-shocked. Um, could you speak a little bit about uh, the connection between what we think of as shell shock and the connection 
to PTSD? Is it the same know? thing? Are there differences? Yeah, I, I think uh, it's really basically post-traumatic okay. stress disorder, um, whether it's shell shock. You know, I, when I was a kid, uh, I remember, or when I was, uh, I was actually was older, I remember my mother telling me that when my father came home from World War II, he was diagnosed with soldier's heart. Soldier's heart, basically, soldier. soldier's heart. And basically what that means is mm -hmm. he was having panic attacks and his heart was beating fast and he, he went to the doctor and that's what the doctor told him. That's also a form of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and uh, I think uh, we have come to think of that, or we were thinking about that for so long as just the isolated events that certain individuals had, and we really didn't realize uh, the overall impact. And I think that's why a lot of healthcare workers who served uh, in war were not thought about. Uh, when I was doing a lot of my work in post-traumatic stress disorder, some of them were moving experiences that I had were well, with nurses who'd served in World War II in Korea, who would come and hear me speak and come up to me and say, thank you so much, because uh, I've just never, ever heard anybody talk about it and share that, and I always knew that I had that within me. So getting it out is just essential. I was, I was able to talk to some of those nurses who were in So Proudly We Hail in that movie, and they do credit the nurses who served in Vietnam with being the first group of women who came forward and said, hey, look, we could be affected by our experience too. It was different, but it really affected us. And post-traumatic stress disorder is just the latest title for soldier's heart, combat fatigue, uh, delayed stress response. I mean, Freud even wrote about that in World War I. So it's not a new phenomena, but it's finally got the recognition that it needed. Thank you. Um Joan, you touched a little bit on um, on the fact that there was sort of a lack of recognition for what nurses and um, women in particular who were in Vietnam for, for whichever reason, um, there was a lack of recognition and a lack of understanding that you were experiencing trauma right alongside all of the soldiers who were there. Um, do you think that this could have contributed to some of your your PTSD or other nurses' PTSD? And relatedly, do you think that the recognition that we're giving to healthcare workers who are, who are battling COVID could mitigate some of the mental health effects? Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, number one, obviously, the obvious answer to the first part of the question is yes, I do. I think that contributed to a lot of it. Um, and uh, I do think uh, uh, the positive way in which people are being responded to will is helpful and we, it will mitigate some of it. I do have concerns ab uh, about um, there's only so much acknowledgement will help. I think uh, the internal responses that you have, you're still going to have. Uh, people don't always appreciate that when you're dealing with that level of trauma or that level of stress, in order to be effective, in order to work, you have to shut down your own feelings and your own responses. Because if you allow them to get the better of you, you can't do your job. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to re-engage with them if you do it long enough. So that even when people say, oh, great job, you know, wonderful, whatever, you say, thank you, it feels good, and everything, all that, but you still are doing some of those behaviors that can be detrimental to you. You're still going home and having a couple of drinks, you're taking a couple of pills to bring yourself down because you're operating at a level. You tell people, I say, you have to understand you're operating at a level of high emotion that uh, an extreme, uh, uh, I don't, I don't know, uh, activity that is really taking both a physiological and emotional toll on you. And, and then you walk away from it and you can't just shut it off. Thank you. Um, there was another question, Eileen, maybe you can elaborate if you wanna to add to this. Um, but there, there's a clear link between 
PTSD and self-medicating and, and, also, and also with suicide. Um, do you, uh, what do you know about the, the links between those things and um, military veterans and healthcare workers in the wars and, and people who are now um, healthcare workers in the fight against COVID? Um, do you think we'll see the same rates of substance abuse and, um, and suicide in our healthcare workers this time around? I would like to be able to say no, <laughs> but I think, uh, as we certainly know from military veterans, we're already seeing high rates of suicide. I think it, it's pretty common knowledge uh, or pretty well known within the healthcare, the treatment community, that it's very common for people with PTSD to have comorbidity and one of the most common comorbidities is substance abuse disorders. Um, and uh, it, it can be a real problem. And I think for healthcare workers, it's, it can become an even more problem because it's another threat to your perception as a, as a professional. So people sometimes want to invest more energy in hiding it than in seeking help for it. Yeah. And um, there should be no shame in that. Um, one of the things I've always, uh, really encourage particularly people in, in supervisory positions to do is to just make people aware of the resources and let them know that they understand that this could be going on. Uh, I think uh, it always amazed me when I came home from Vietnam, uh, I was stationed at an army hospital with a bunch of other nurses who had come home from Vietnam. We never talked about it, never. People would say, how are you, where'd you serve? End of story. And as I, I moved on in my career, I always thought, what a lost opportunity that was. There could have been groups. We could have been brought together uh, with a mental health professional to just talk out what our experiences had been. I think people are, are doing more of that. I know I've heard some stories about um, hospitals setting up rooms where people can go and relax and uh, people are acknowledging and I think that's going to be helpful. So I, I'm hoping that that combined with a better understanding of PTSD and very honestly, Dr. Breen's story, I, I was really touched that her family was so willing to share that because it, it, it was so moving and it was such a tragic loss uh, that this incredibly bright productive woman uh, killed herself because she was so overwhelmed uh, by her own experiences, her, her illness, um, and she didn't feel anyone uh, would understand that. We're, we're almost out of time, but just as one last question, if anyone in the audience um, knows someone or they themselves is experiencing symptoms of PTSD, what do you suggest? How, what can they do to help their loved one or help themselves in that situation? Well, there, go ahead, Joan. Go ahead, go ahead, Beth, go. No, I mean, there are hotlines set up uh, through professional organizations. Um, certainly the VA has a hotline, the different uh, veterans groups do. Um, there's a lot of help out there um, for people who think that they might have issues. And people are beginning to address what's happened to the people with the COVID-9 nurses and healthcare workers during the pandemic. It's easy to find the information. I suggest you do what we all do, Google PTSD assistance um, for healthcare workers, and I know there'll be resources to come up. And I would also say, and, and very honestly, and I'll, I'll share this, this was with myself. When I came home from I always tell people my first five years home from Vietnam was, were really like a nightmare. And my older sister, who watched that movie with me when she was 12 and I was 10, she intervened. She uh, came and said, Joan, you, you're not yourself. Um, and uh, she was concerned about uh, where I was. And uh, she actually, uh, she worked in one of the, uh, in the mental health field. 
and set me up with someone. And this was back before anybody knew about PTSD. Um, I think it's important if you see someone and you, you realize they're not being themselves, that in a, in a very loving and caring way, you, uh, you express that to them and express it in a way that shows you understand and to acknowledge that, you, that the individual has been through an experience that uh, it's hard for other people to understand and that that experience can impact them and that there is no shame in getting help, that sometimes just talking about it and sharing it can really change their life. Well, thank you, Joan. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Eileen now. Um, we're unfortunately out of time, but Eileen, will you send us off? Yeah, thank you, Joan, again, and Beth for this powerful um, webinar. And we wanna thank everybody for joining us and we hope that everybody's safe and get whatever assistance you need or you know take care of your battle buddies in this case so we hope to see you at another one of our events in the future stay safe thank you thank you both thank you. very much and thank Joan, you. it's been quite a time thank you Beth. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much bye-bye thanks for listening thanks everybody thanks everybody for attending see you all soon